Good afternoon. It's that week where the traffic suddenly gets much worse uh, in Bethesda and its surrounding areas. Uh, it's the week where kids go back to school, sometimes smiling, sometimes complaining, sometimes both. Uh, it's the week where the first uh, NFL football game occurs uh, this evening. Uh, I won't even talk about politics. And it's also the week where we kick off the Wednesday afternoon lecture series. And uh, it is wonderful to see you all here and to welcome you, as well as those who are watching uh, by video cast, uh, probably in great numbers, because uh, that tends to be the case. And I hope you have seen the lineup uh, of Wall's lectures uh, for this academic year, because it is truly stellar. And I would encourage all of you who haven't already done so uh, to go and mark your calendars uh, for 3 o'clock on Wednesday afternoons uh, to try to protect that time for what is going to be quite an amazing parade uh, of remarkable scientific leaders covering a wide variety of topics uh, of interest uh, to all of us. A lot of effort goes into identifying uh, the speakers for this series with lots of input uh, from all of the institutes. Uh, and we are, I'm glad to say, quite successful in lining up uh, the people that we most want to have come and speak because this is seen as a very prestigious place uh, to come and speak about your science. Uh, so I would encourage everyone uh, to try to be sure to take advantage of that uh, during the coming months. Uh, you will learn a lot, uh, and you will go in way enriched, I think, and inspired by the nature of the uh, talks that you hear about cutting-edge uh, research in biomedicine. Today's uh, kickoff uh, is a great example of that, and we're delighted to have as our speaker today uh, Dr. Levi Garraway. Uh, he is an MD and a PhD and has had most of his professional uh, career in fact, I would say just about all of it in the city of Boston, having received his undergraduate degree at Harvard, his medical degree, and his PhD uh, from Harvard, where then he followed on uh, being a resident in internal medicine at the Mass General and was also a chief resident at MGH. Uh, he followed that with clinical fellowships in medical oncology uh, at Dana-Farber and Brigham and Women's, and he is now an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and in the Department of Medical Oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, as well as serving as associate physician at Brigham and Women's and senior associate member at the Broad Institute, uh, keeping himself connected with all of these amazing institutions uh, up there in the city of Boston. Uh, he has received a number of important honors. I'll mention one uh, because it's sort of a nice NIH connection. Uh, he was one of the very first to receive one of the NIH Director's New Innovators Award. This is an award specifically designed uh, for individuals who at that time had not previously served as a PI on an NIH grant and who had a particularly innovative, uh, creative approach uh, to a problem uh, that was considered groundbreaking. And to get one of those was an extremely competitive process. Uh, so uh, Levi must have written a bang up proposal uh, to, uh, to achieve this. His uh, proposal there was on defining melanoma therapeutic avenues by integrative uh, functional genomics. Uh, he's also uh, a member of the ASCI. Uh, and his research, as you will hear, has been very much on the leading edge of precision medicine for cancer. And specifically, in the talk he's about to discuss today, going beyond that first level of identifying what kind of actionable mutations might occur in a particular cancer but also identifying a priori and ahead of time, if possible, which cancers are going to be responsive and which are not uh, to targeted anti-cancer therapeutics. Uh, he has made many contributions to that field and published more papers uh, than I can uh, read off to you just in the last year or two. And so it is a great pleasure and a great privilege uh, to have him as our kickoff speaker. And I would ask you uh, to give a warm welcome uh, to Dr. Levi Garraway. Well, thank you, Dr. Collins, for that really wonderful introduction. Uh, my NIH New Innovator Award is, as it happens, just ending, and I'm already missing it, but that's what grant writing is all about. So I'm very pleased to be here and give this lecture and have a chance to describe to you, at least from my perspective and I think the perspective of, of a lot of investigators in the field of cancer, the excitement and the promise of the 
emerging era of genomics-driven cancer medicine. And by genomics-driven cancer medicine, one can think of that as a subset of precision medicine, but I think in cancer, many of us appreciate that the first instance of precision medicine will be using genetic DNA-based alterations and uh, exploring the extent to which we can improve the care of cancer patients. And the other point I think here is that in moving into this era, it's really about testing a hypothesis that has been brewing really for decades. And that hypothesis is shown on this slide, which is that the use of cancer genomic information to guide treatment choice may offer a categorical means to improve the care of cancer patients. That suggests that many, if not most, patients with cancer would benefit from some type of uh, systematic genomic profile and the use of that result to guide uh, treatment choice. And of course, the rationale for, the, for testing this hypothesis uh, is rooted in several uh, key observations that have been present, many of which have been uh, present for a long time, but others have been more recently relevant. The first is that uh, molecular pathways involved in tumor survival and progression are often enacted by genetic alterations. We, we've known this for a long time. Uh, projects such as the Cancer Genome Atlas are reinforcing this every day. But the second and third points here are a little bit more recently manifest. Anti-cancer agents targeting many oncogenic pathways have entered clinical trials. This really, at the scale and scope that it is now true, has only been the case for the past two or three years. Now, for the first time in history, we can say that the major clinical, the major signaling pathways that we have known about, MAP kinase pathway, PR3 kinase pathway, many receptor tyrosine kinases, uh, mechanisms of apoptosis and metabolism are being targeted by not just one but multiple drugs and multiple nodes in those pathways. So that's a critical ingredient for testing this hypothesis. And then the final point that's on this slide is that the genomics technologies have grown to the point where they enable robust tumor genomic profiling in the clinical arena. So even though we've known that cancer is a disease of the genome for quite some time, we now have a repertoire of components in place that allow us to test the guiding hypothesis of the cancer genome era from a clinical perspective. And the testing of that also uh, inspires a, a framework which admittedly in most cancer centers is still largely aspirational, but has some definition to it in terms of what, the, what process, what infrastructure is needed to push this hypothesis. And it begins, of course, uh, in a patient-centered uh, fashion. The notion is that we encounter patients either in a uh, focused way, uh, prioritizing particular characteristics of the patients, or in some cases, perhaps in some cancer centers in an enterprise-wide way. But ultimately, we hope that we can use tissue, ideally fresh biopsy material, and generate profiling uh, using either existing or increasingly emerging technologies that will then generate data that we now apply uh, new algorithms uh, and perhaps in some cases uh, uh, lab, uh, correlative lab testing uh, to interpret the data. And with that, we will be equipped as oncologists to make management decisions. And the input into the decision may come from review of the data by a committee, uh, by having uh, frameworks in place, uh, pathway-like frameworks, uh, clinical pathway-like frameworks to guide decision making, and ultimately uh, in the near term being applied in, uh, in uh, hypothesis-driven phase one trials or other uh, mechanism-based uh, clinical studies. And then with that decision, we will then look to see whether or not all of this input increased the prevalence of clinical responses, and there are a variety of ways that we can do that. The other uh, hope would be that uh, often we can gain another biopsy at this point so that we can understand whether or not our clinical experiment was accomplished therapeutically. Did we actually inhibit the target the way we hoped? And then finally, if we see responses or if we, whether we do or we don't, we need to understand mechanisms of drug resistance because certainly, particularly if these are single agent studies, we recognize that even if we are fortunate to get responses, these are often short-lived and advanced cancer. So doing yet another biopsy at the point of relapse uh, could be crucial in discerning for us mechanisms of resistance that therefore can inform either a salvage therapy or perhaps a novel therapeutic combination that could subsequently be uh, tested at the beginning of this process. Now, I think it's naive to assume that every cancer center could put in every component of this engine, but yet it's a nice archetype for thinking about the types of activities and processes and uh, 
technologies and algorithms that need to be pursued in parallel to bring uh, this notion of precision medicine forward. So clearly it's going to be occupying us greatly for the next uh, decade or more. So for this talk, I'd like to, at a relatively high level, touch on aspects that our lab has been pursuing that really get to uh, three underlying activities that can be informed by various components of this process. The first of which, sort of at the front end, where one is generating and interpreting data, um, speaks to the need to understand salient driver mutations, particularly those that could be actionable using our therapeutic armamentarium. Uh, and I'll give you a vignette there. Uh, the second is the actual clinical testing. How are we going to uh, actually carry out clinical tests of the precision medicine hypothesis? And the third is uh, leveraging information at the back end, both uh, tissue-based studies and uh, coordinated uh, systematic experimental studies to understand mechanism resistance and, uh, and incorporate the knowledge of both resistance and the spectrum of uh, dependencies into the uh, future development of novel combinations, the goal of which would be durable control of specific cancers that are driven by um, cardinal genetic alterations. So to begin, uh, I'd like to tell you a story of how moving uh, from the catalog of alterations that are being generated by efforts such as TCGA to really knowledge of salient driver events uh, was a problem that we needed to solve in a cancer that has been a major focus in our lab, which is melanoma. And uh, we, as have many others, including uh, your Dennis Samuels, who is here, uh, have been sequencing melanoma genomes and trying to understand uh, what biology and, and new drivers there may be. And this is a figure from a recent report uh, of whole genome sequencing in melanoma. And one of the most prominent features that leaps out is that the mutation rate in melanoma is actually rather high. So uh, this is uh, showing mutations per megabase. The melanomas over here on the right are more typical of what we would expect for a lot of epithelial malignancies, but there's a vast excess of mutational load, and that is almost completely attributable to the mutational signature that is characteristic of UV light. So UV uh, causes major damage in melanoma. We knew that, but this gives us a clear view of this. But actually, this phenomenon posed a huge problem from the standpoint of discerning driver versus passenger mutations. And there are three components of that problem that I'll just highlight briefly for you. Uh, but the, just to kind of illustrate the, the breadth of the problem, if you look at the mutational rate of melanoma and you consider the vital stats of a recent whole exome sequencing project that we carried out, one sees that in 121 whole exomes, we saw nearly 87,000 independent coding mutations uh, which meant that there were 14,000 genes mutated at least once, so two-thirds of the genome had at least one somatic mutation, and there were 515 genes mutated in at least 10 percent of samples. Now, if you discover a gene that's mutated in 10 percent of a cancer, that is a respectable mutation frequency. That, those kinds of genes could, in principle, have a substantial clinical impact if they were actionable, but this seemed like an awfully large number of genes to really be biologically relevant. And, and when one started to apply statistical algorithms that sort of predicted uh, what you would expect by chance, there was clearly inflation. So there were 700 genes that were deemed statistically significant by the algorithms that were sort of state of the art at the time. So that just seemed a little bit too high. More, more concerning was the fact that, in general, the most significantly mutated genes tended actually as a whole to be absent or very uh, minimally expressed in melanoma. And so that was a bit of a concern. Obviously, any given uh, gene might show low expression for any of a number of reasons, but to see sort of a whole category of quote unquote significantly mutated genes poorly expressed was a red flag. And perhaps uh, the most uh, the most deeply concerning aspect of this problem was that when we considered the silent mutation rate, meaning the mutations that did not give rise to, give rise to amino acid substitutions in the respective genes, one found that in general the, the statistically significantly mutated genes tended to have a very high ratio of silent mutations. So this was a deep concern that despite our uh, heretofore attempts to apply robust uh, uh, controls for the size of a gene and the sample specific mutation rates, et cetera, we were still leaky in terms of uh, lots of passenger mutations coming in uh, with the drivers. So how do we solve that problem? 
Iran Hodas, who uh, was a an associate computational biologist in the lab, had the notion that we might need to refine our definition of background mutation rates. So typically we thought of background mutation rates as genome uniform. So more or less it would occur randomly within the genome. It just may be that a given sample may have a higher mutation rate than others, but at a genome level it would be random. But maybe that was wrong. And we actually know that there are heterogeneous aspects of the background mutation rate. Transcribed genes are mutated at a lower frequency than untranscribed genes. Uh, there are variations depending on whether it's coding or non-coding parts of the genome, introns that are transcribed versus those that are not transcribed. So we know that this actually can vary, and perhaps, particularly when you have a, an extra layer of mutational insult, this was posing a problem. So the notion actually can be shown additionally uh, pictorially here, which uh, shows this hypothetical example. These are exons. This is intronic sequence. So these are exons that have equivalent mutation ratios, if you look at just the exon mutation rate. However, you could imagine a scenario where uh, there was uh, one locus that has a high background mutation rate, in which case you would also see high intronic mutations, but another locus that has a low uh, intronic mutation rate. Uh, in this case, you might expect um, these are mostly passenger events, that, this, that it just so happens that this locus has high generation and low repair, but this might actually have undergone evolutionary selection. So the question was, how could you enrich for loci that actually underwent evolutionary selection in cancer? It turns out that when you generate whole exome sequencing data, even though you're targeting pulling down the exonic sequence, you actually get a whole bunch of intronic sequence as well. The reason for this is because the fragments that you pull down uh, with, the, with the baits that are targeting the genome uh, tend to be, they're, they're, they're more or less randomly generated, so you get a whole distribution of, 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 uh, of sort of adjacent intronic material that comes down for the ride. And that allows us, at least in the regions flanking the exons to calculate the intronic mutation rate, even though we typically only care about the exonic mutations. So that allowed us to develop an, an algorithm that essentially tallies the mutational burden at each locus, allows uh, a permutation of the, uh, of the, of the mutations in a locus-specific way across the sample set that gives us a background mutational distribution, and if the, the mutational burden uh, is considered to fall outside of that mutation, we could say that there's evidence of positive selection, whereas if it, if it uh, falls within this burden, there would more, more or less be background, even if there are multiple recurrent exonic mutations. So that was the notion, and we could apply additional algorithms such as polyfin to, um, to annotate these mutations as plausibly functional or, or damaging, and now we can sort of see how did we do compared to uh, the prior approaches. And indeed, this algorithm, if one just considers the criteria of selection, uh, where there was a low expression in prior uh, significant genes, suddenly now you're at a situation where, in general, the mutations, the genes that are being called significant are, in fact, expressed in melanoma. And now when you look at this QQ plot where there was this vast inflation earlier, we now see a much more uh, of a distribution in line of what you would expect by chance until you get to a few genes that sort of are clear outliers. And so these 11 genes uh, caught our attention. There were several very interesting aspects of genes, one of which, uh, the, actually maybe the most notable, was a gene called RAC1, which is a, a member of the RAS GTPA superfamily. There was actually a highly recurrent mutation at uh, codon 29. Uh, there were actually other members of this family that had analogous mutations, and functional studies that I can't describe in great detail suggested that, in fact, um, this mutation, the P29S, did, in fact, activate RAC as, uh, as evidenced by, uh, um, by a, uh, a GTP loading assay. So indeed, this was a functional mutation. Now very interesting to think about the relevance of this GTPA to melanoma biology, but there were several other interesting mutations that uh, caught our attention that had not been previously known. For example, this protein phosphatase, PPP6C, which has not been described as a cancer gene, but it is known to interact with cyclin D and negatively regulate cyclin D, and all of these mutations were predicted to be uh, loss of function uh, events, and, and there were several stop colons in this panel. So this is potentially a novel uh, tumor suppressor gene. Uh, this is another gene, sorting nexin 31, which is a gene that has been reported to interact with, uh, with activated HRAS, so this may be a RAS effector protein. And here's another gene, TAC1, uh, which 
is, again, reported to stimulate both RAS signaling and PI3 kinase signaling to critical cancer pathways. This gene also interacts with Aurora kinase, as does PPP6C, the gene I mentioned a couple of slides ago. So there are a number of interesting genes that are clearly showing evidence of positive selection during melanoma evolution and have a, a point a finger to novel biological mechanisms that we had not previously recognized in this malignancy. Now you can flip this around and uh, ask not just about uh, activating mutations or, or uh, functional mutational burning, but specifically focus on loss of function events. And when one does that, we see some interesting hits emerge, for example, ARID2. ARID2 is, uh, is, is a homologue to genes such as ARID1A, ARID1B, which are members of, of the switch SNF uh, chromatin modifying complex. This is actually a, a complex uh, components of which have now been shown to be mutated in many different cancers. So we can add melanoma to the list of cancers that have significantly recurrent mutations in chromatin modifying enzymes. So this was a, a quite a useful study that can focus studies of chromatin biology in melanoma. And uh, just to kind of make a brief point of a subset of the mutations that we saw uh, in, in, by this analysis. We, of course, know very well that a large fraction of mutations have oncogenic BRAF mutations and oncogenic NRAS mutations, but there have been a substantial subset of maybe 10 or 15 or so percent of melanomas that lack either of these mutations. And one of the interesting observations, which was confirmed by a study that came out by uh, Ruth Halliban at Yale, was that many of these BRAF, NRAS, wild-type melanomas have nonsense NF1 mutations. NF1 is a RAS gap, so its normal function is to inhibit RAS signaling, so it makes perfect sense that loss of function of NF1, which would deregulate RAS, would be uh, another mechanism of MAP kinase pathway activation in melanoma, and we can now assign this as potentially a cancer gene in that subset of melanoma. So altogether, we can put together, we can put the, take the output of this uh, algorithm to look for positive selection, together with some Bayesian mining of uh, the list of known cancer genes, and define a landscape of melanoma driver genes, which we would not argue to be complete, but certainly we have largely eliminated the problem of massive passenger uh, dilution of the signal. And so therefore, getting back to this issue of salient, understanding salient driver genes from which we can now look to understand actionable uh, therapeutic manipulations, uh, this was a necessary component of melanoma biology and was enabled by this kind of study. So, uh, so this, and there are many examples of studies like this, uh, taking the next step going from list of mutations to the, the salient subset for clinical use that are ongoing in many different cancer types. So now I'd like to turn uh, my attention to another effort that's been going on sort of on the opposite end of the precision medicine uh, process, which is to dissect using both sequencing and preclinical studies mechanisms of resistance and to use that to come up with novel frameworks for therapeutic combinations. And here the notion is that single drugs are unlikely to cure or durably control most metastatic melanoma. We need to understand what types of combinations, possibly three or four drug combinations, might be given in various cocktails to patients with particular genetic alterations. And it's, it, it, certainly it's been shown in heme malignancies, for example, that cocktails are what are need to, uh, to achieve durable control or cure in cancer. So understanding mechanisms of resistance might help us with that, particularly in melanoma, when there are a variety of therapies that are either now FDA approved, such as RAF inhibitors, or in advanced clinical development. Uh, against uh, the MAP kinase cascade, which is activated mutationally by mutations in BRAF, particularly at codon 600 of BRAF. So this is an area where understanding resistance is incredibly important because despite the increase in survival by using RAF inhibitors in BRAF mutant melanoma, the resistance is quite prevalent, and actually this is prevalent in two ways. One is if you look at this waterfall plot where the, the fraction of patients that have clinical benefit are shown sort of below the zero line, if we apply a formal criteria for clinical response, uh, a clinical partial response, we see that really only a, a subset of these patients actually achieved a partial response. A large fraction of patients, although they're benefiting, 
there's a lot of tumor around. So intrinsic resistance is a major issue. Furthermore, the median survival is only about six months with a RAF inhibitor. It looks like if you add a MEK inhibitor to a RAF inhibitor, you can push this out some, but not by a whole lot. You'll probably gain another three months or four months on average, but by no means are we a durable control. So resistance to this otherwise very successful targeted agent in a genetically driven cancer subtype is a pervasive problem. So how are we going to get on top of that problem? How are we going to solve this problem? Well, we first of all can benefit from the fact that we know <coughs> a fair bit about themes of resistance to kinase inhibitors. So BRAF mutation, which activates the MAP kinase pathway in melanoma, is a kinase-driven, uh, both genetically driven and kinase-driven cancer. So if you take a kinase inhibitor and you get a response and you relapse, the relapse can fall into really three major categories, uh, typically, not universally, but typically. One major category is reactivation of the target. Often this occurs by acquiring a secondary genetic alteration, but this can also happen by activating upstream effectors, so you essentially put the target into overdrive and the drug just is not as effective at a given dose. An alternative approach is that a bypass mechanism gets activated. So you essentially work around the effect of the kinase inhibitor. You engage some parallel cascade and uh, feed in to the downstream oncogenic uh, output in a way that leads to resistance. The third major category is that one can activate downstream effectors. So members of the pathway that act downstream of the target oncoprotein, if you just turn them back on, you can, you can achieve resistance. An example of a bypass effector that we've known about for several years is the activation of the MET tyrosine kinase in lung cancers that are driven by mutations in the EGFR, the uh, epidermal growth factor receptor, and treated with uh, inhibitors of that receptor. An example of an activation of a downstream effector is, a recent example is KRAS mutations in colon cancers that are treated with inhibitors of EGFR. So these are three major categories of resistance to kinase-based uh, therapeutics in cancer. The typical output, the typical effect of these, though, is to reactivate the downstream pathway uh, and therefore lead to disease progression. In general, we haven't we don't have a great understanding of mechanisms that can go all the way around the original pathway uh, and, and cause disease progression. Most of the time, you turn the pathway back on downstream by some mechanism, and that leads to disease progression. So with this framework, uh, we could set out to begin to understand mechanisms of resistance to RAF inhibition in melanoma. And the approach that we've been taking, it, been taking is to blend systematic experimental studies, preclinical studies, uh, which are aimed at systematic functional screens that define the universe of resistance mechanisms, and I'll describe some of these shortly. And the idea is to blend these with uh, the results of deep omic sequencing, deep clinical characterization of samples acquired prior to treatment and following relapse. And the notion is that that integration uh, can allow us to see clinically relevant uh, both a spectrum of, of, of candidates that can cause resistance and a filter using clinical data to see which do cause resistance, and the hope is that we could leverage this knowledge to speed the design of rational therapeutic combinations, and I'll show you shortly how we're thinking about this in melanoma. Now one of the first uh, patients that underwent sequencing, and it wasn't at that time whole exome sequencing, it was targeted exome sequencing, but it was this patient who uh, had widespread uh, melanoma, re refractory to a variety of conventional therapeutics, who had a BRAF mutation, went on the RAF inhibitor, had a dramatic response, but unfortunately after really only uh, several weeks, three months or so, there was a widespread uh, tumor, uh, tumor relapse. Now this uh, spectrum of pictures raises many questions, one of which is, did every tumor uh, have the same mechanism of resistance? And of course, you know, these are not answerable without sort of autopsy-based studies. We only could uh, sequence a specimen from one tumor, but that specimen was highly informative because what came out was a mutation in MEK. So MEK is the kinase immediately downstream of BRAF in the MAP kinase cascade. The mutation uh, was conferred robust pharmacologic resistance to a RAF inhibitor, uh, as well as cross-resistance to a MEK inhibitor, which had actually not been given, but if a MEK inhibitor had been given, it would not have worked in this setting. This is seen pharmacologically and recapitulated le measuring ERK phosphorylation in these Western blots here. So uh, in parallel 
though, we had been, our lab had been conducting random mutagenesis screens, which involves taking cDNA from MET kinase, mutagenizing that cDNA, introducing it into sensitive melanoma cell lines that had the BRAF VC100 mutation, and asking, are there alleles, secondary alleles, that can promote drug resistance in vitro? So we did this either with a MEK inhibitor as the selective agent or a RAF inhibitor as the selective agent. And this allowed us to get a reasonably robust uh, distribution of individual mutations within MEK itself that could confer resistance. And these fell into a couple of different categories. I'm not going to go through this in excruciating detail, but what I'm showing you here is the uh, distribution within the MEK1 cDNA of uh, of quote unquote high frequency uh, or robust mutations uh, that were associated with resistance, either if MEK inhibitor was the selective agent or if RAF inhibitor was the selective agent. And a couple of themes that emerged from this was that there were mutations in the, in the N terminus, which contains an inhibitory alpha helix, the A helix, uh, such as this uh, Q56P mutation, uh, as well as several others in that region that were associated with resistance to one or other inhibitor. There were also a whole cluster of mutations uh, in the C helix, which is a component of the, of the MET kinase that has to adopt the sort of fully active conformation. It has to sort of uh, become what we call a closed conformation. A whole series of mutations uh, in this uh, were able to confer resistance to one or another inhibitor. And uh, the, the codon, the cysteine-121 that I showed you a couple slides ago falls sort of right smack in the middle of this this cluster is right in this same region. And then finally, we saw mutations in the kinase domain, such as uh, around between codons 203 and 211 uh, that were able to uh, confer resistance. So they sort of fell into functional categories. And very recently, uh, what was quite satisfying is that uh, a study by a clinical team of melanoma oncologists that was presented in abstract form at ASCO just this past June has shown that if one looks at uh, melanomas at progression compared to baseline, one sees uh, several instances of MEK1 mutations that were present uh, at progression and absent at relapse that were identified by the random mutagenesis screens that we did and published several years ago. So this is quite satisfying. Some of these are actually quite straightforward and easy to interpret. One, uh, which is uh, the mutation at, uh, at uh, the proline of conon-124, which is either a leucine or a serine substitution, is a little confusing because it can clearly arise in association with resistance, but it also can be present de novo, and in some cases, uh, patients can still respond. So it's a little bit complicated what's happening, although I'm going to show you some data to speak to that shortly. But clearly, though, uh, the, several of these mutations were known to cause resistance. So one of the studies that we had done uh, several years ago had been to take a patient who had been treated with a MEK inhibitor, had a BRAF mutation, and responded to the MEK inhibitor. Uh, and we found that uh, the patient responded, but when they developed relapse, we were able to, to, to culture a, cells from this patient. They were strongly resistant to the MEK inhibitor. They actually had this P124L mutation. When you reintroduce that allele, however, you could certainly shift the GI50, but the magnitude of shift was much less than what had been seen in the short-term culture. Now, similarly, if you look at, instead of a MEK inhibitor, you look at a RAF inhibitor, which is, of course, the clinical candidate, you actually saw even a more profound resistance effect. So there was a cross-resistant effect in the short-term culture, culture um, that was quite dramatic. But if you looked at the effect of P124L, it was actually, you could, you could get a shift, but it was rather marginal. Now, Here's Q56P, so this has now been seen clinically. This was actually, it came out of a random immunogenesis screen, but clearly a robust shift. Uh, so P124L was less so, but I'm going to show you some more data shortly that I think explains this dichotomy. Uh, the, the, the other point was that we found uh, a mutation at, at position 203 when we did our random immunogenesis screens with the MEK inhibitor, but used the RAF inhibitor as the selective agent. So basically, each of the mutations that have now emerged clinically were shown preclinically to be relevant to resistance uh, in a satisfying way. Now, we have recent data where if you look at this uh, P124, actually in this case it's P124S, not L, and you look at it now in the context of an inducible system, so rather than sort of uh, steady state infection selection and then sometime later doing the experiment, you induce expression of MEK and then you do your experiments, you can clearly see that this codon, when induced in some way, can shift the GI50 
uh, quite robustly. Now, this is true with two RAF inhibitors. It's also true uh, with a MEK inhibitor. So we, th there's complexity here, but it may well be that either in cooperation with other uh, uh, resistance effectors or uh, in an inducible pattern as opposed to a steady state pattern, there could be a means by which uh, proline-124 causes resistance. But the big picture here is that a blend of target-based systematic preclinical studies together with uh, deep sequencing of clinical specimens allowed us to clearly um, nominate a distribution of alleles that can confer resistance to uh, these inhibitors, several of which now can be shown to be relevant clinically. Now, the other approach, though, has been to move away from focusing solely on a particular target, but to now go to a near genome scale. And to carry this out, uh, the notion has been to leverage a resource that's been developed at the Broad Institute in which uh, it, the large majority of, of genes from the human genome that we know of have been cloned into lintiviral or libraries. And so the notion is to take these libraries, introduce them in arrayed format, arrayed microtider format, into sensitive melanoma cells that harbor the VC center mutation and do essentially a phenotypic rescue screen in the presence of otherwise inhibitory concentrations of a RAF inhibitor. And the initial study that we published a couple years ago was a pilot because we focused rather than on the entire orpheome on just the kinases, and the output of that was quite revealing for several reasons, one of which is that, uh, the major one is that, th that there were several uh, kinases that scored as resistance effectors that essentially bore at least thematic, if not direct mechanistic uh, similarity to what have subsequently been shown to be clinically relevant resistance mechanisms. So one category was that there were several uh, receptor tyrosine kinases that clearly were sufficient to confer resistance, and these were validated in independent melanoma cell lines. It's now clear that receptor tyrosine kinases do, in fact, comprise a relevant mechanism of resistance. Uh, there are a variety that have been uh, described. I won't be able to go through all of them, but suffice it to say that this captured that thematic category quite nicely. We also found that CRAF uh, could confer resistance, which was quite satisfying because uh, CRAF is, of course, a, uh, the sister to BRAF, and if you put it into overdrive, there's some very interesting mechanisms involving dimerization uh, by which it leads to resistance, uh, and I'll, get, uh, I'll say a little bit more about that shortly. The big uh, and novel observation in this study was a gene called COT, which is a kinase that is a cousin to BRAF. It's not a RAF family member, but it clearly phosphorylates and activates MEK. And so uh, this whole spectrum of kinases converged onto several mechanisms that made sense, each of which, as shown by this Western blot looking at fossil work compared to the uh, wild type setting or the control setting, uh, led to sustained ERK activation. So if you aggregate the results of this, uh, actually, before I get to that, let me just make one more point, which is that coming back to this, uh, this P124L mutation and it's showing this short-term culture that had this discordance between uh, what you see if you just put in MAC P124L versus the resistant phenotype, it turns out that that short-term culture, which is, was uh, resistant, drug-resistant short-term culture, had, had whopping COT expression in addition to MAC P124L. So this suggests that multiple mechanisms of resistance can exist within the same tumor, certainly even within the same cancer cell. Now, if we come back to this notion of mechanisms of resistance to kinase-driven uh, therapy in cancer, and you start to overlay what we have now learned thus far with RAF, inhibin uh, RAF inhibition in melanoma, what we can say is that uh, although nobody has yet seen secondary mutations uh, directly within BRAF, clearly RAF dysregulation has been observed as a mechanism. Roger Lowe's group described mechanisms uh, of mutations in NRAS, which is, of course, upstream of RAF in the MAP kinase pathway, which essentially put RAF into overdrive. There are BRAF splicing uh, variants that can dimerize constitutively and activate CRAF. And our group, I don't have time to talk about it, has, has identified, again, using random mutagenesis, a series of mutations in CRAF that can put RAF into overdrive. And then uh, there was a recent paper by Roger Lowe's group suggesting that some melanomas may have BRAF amplification, which again, through dimerization, would put RAF into overdrive. So these are target-based mechanisms. And actually, I should say that most of the, all of the RAF inhibitors that are currently in clinical use also hit CRAF. So these are target-based mechanisms of resistance. Now, the bypass arm is explained by receptor tyrosine kinases and uh, the kinase COT. And the downstream effector is sort of accounted for by mutations in MEK1. So we can neatly, uh, we can populate these bins of, of resistance mechanisms by multiple individual 
uh, mechanisms that have been described uh, by, uh, by us and others in the field. Now, the, the problem here at one level is that there is no evidence right now that knowledge of individual resistance mutations is saturating. We have no notion that we have identified anywhere close to the full spectrum of resistance mechanism. And so on the one hand, that seems like a problem. I mean, it seems like if we're going to end up having dozens of independent resistance mechanisms, doesn't that thwart our ability to apply precision medicine, precision medicine, have maybe three or four drugs as a cocktail? And the answer could be yes, but the more optimistic view is that if you look at this more carefully, one sees that although there are multiple individual mechanisms, they tend to converge on these themes. And in fact, one of the themes is reactivating MAP kinase, uh, and actually this ends up working out to be at the level of ERK. So I'll come back to this, but there may be, in fact, par parsimonious convergences of individual mechanisms onto sort of limiting cellular effector nodes that could be exploited by a much smaller number of clinical combinations, even though the number of individual mechanisms that we could count might go into the dozens or hundreds. Now, that notion can be tested uh, preclinically by expanding this systematic functional screening approach out of just the kinome, but now to sort of a near genome. And this is what we have recently completed. We have used the full Broad uh, ORF collection, lentiviral ORF collection, uh, to screen uh, a, a basically a quarter of a million individual uh, instances, again using our workhorse A375 melanoma cell line that has the BRAF v mutation. It's sensitive to MAP kinase pathway inhibitors. Here, though, the phenotypic rescue was done at a genome scale, or near, near genome scale, with not just a RAF inhibitor, but also a MEK inhibitor or an ERK inhibitor or the combination of a RAF and a MEK inhibitor. The, the notion here is that these instances, the, these conditions phenotypically mimic the clinical trials that are ongoing in the field right now. So as many of you know, there are clinical trials that are ongoing testing the combination of a RAF and a MEK inhibitor, which look promising in terms of improving the scenario. There are also clinical trials of an ERK inhibitor. So here, the goal is twofold. One is to begin to anticipate the spectrum of resistance mechanisms that are likely to emerge even with drugs that are only just now in clinical trials where the clinical studies haven't yet caught up. That's number one. And number two is to test this hypothesis that there may be a convergence onto limiting cellular nodes that, that even though we might see many individual hits. So when you look at what's come out of this screen thus far, uh, we can see with this heat map that most of, the, most of the genes that have scored, and there are about 170 or so, are validating, and you can see this because blue means that there's no activity. These are a bunch of controls. But if the cells are, if the, if the pixels here are either white or red, that means that there was a, uh, a percent rescue that was at a z-score, which is essentially a coefficient of variation that was very high in the screen as a whole. And you can see that most, not all, but most of these are, are validated, and in fact, many of them, uh, a substantial fraction, actually are pan-resistant, so that means no matter where in the map kinase pathway you hit, you get resistance, and so you, we can see that. We can also begin to bin these individual hits into categories, and in, in, in addition to signal transduction factors such as kinases, which we expected to see, we're seeing some very interesting additional families, such as GTP exchange factors, G protein couple receptors, uh, and a very prominent set of transcription factors. And so already, you can see, based on these high-level views, that we can begin to populate novel bypass mechanisms, novel downstream effectors that are even below ERK, and begin to annotate what the spectrum of resistance might look like. Uh, I'm just going to briefly point out that we've also done the converse experiment, not with overexpression of ORFs, but by knocking down genes with uh, pooled RNAi, and an output of that screen, which has been very interesting, has been uh, NF1 emerging as a prominent loss of function effector, and that, again, makes perfect sense. As I mentioned earlier from the genetic data, we know that NF1 uh, encodes a GTPase activating protein or a GAP, uh, and its loss would dysregulate RAS signaling, so it makes perfect sense that loss of NF1 would confer resistance to RAF inhibition. So now, what we'd like to do with this preclinical spectrum, as I mentioned earlier, is to integrate uh, the results of the preclinical data with the results of deep clinical characterization. Now, what I will tell you is that we still are not at the point in the field where there is a robust 
collection of many dozens of pretreatment post-relapse melanoma specimens that have been subjected to whole exome and transcriptome sequencing. We and others are working on that, but we don't have it yet. But it turns out that even if you intersect these results with our preclinical data, for example, the exome sequencing project that I just told you about, one learns some interesting thing. And rather than walking you through all of the steps of how we did the integration, I'm just going to show you a picture that is emerging, and you'll have to wait till we submit our paper to kind of, you know, believe the experiments that support this. But suffice it to say that if you look at this picture, this is the kind of core map kinase signaling cascade. These are the inhibitors that are being either currently used or uh, tested in the clinic. Uh, if you have one asterisk, that means that you were a gene that was significantly mutated in melanoma. If you have two asterisks, it means that you've been implicated in clinical resistance to RAF inhibition. So, uh, we have our uh, core modules here. We have genes like COT and others. But now you can see that, uh, you know, NF1, which we had seen showing up uh, enriched in wild-type, wild-type melanoma, but there are certainly BRF mutant melanomas that have NF1 mutations. It's showing up on our list. But also, we can see that uh, genes uh, and, and sort of effectors that are in pink are hits that have come out of our ORF screen. And we can now begin to nominate clear modules that look like they could function as bypass effectors, and we know that there are functional interactions. So G-protein coupled receptor-based signaling uh, can activate certain transcription factors, uh, basically what's already known in the literature. Uh, the, this GTPase mechanism, of which RAC1 certainly fits into this, uh, as does uh, PREX2, which I don't have time to describe, but we recently uh, published on this. So the nice thing about this is that, indeed, it seems we can readily construct a model wherein the individual hits from our ORF screens are not just scattered all over the, uh, the genome. They're actually converging functionally, or at least they readily fit models of signaling cascades that we already know about that could plausibly be bypass effectors that we need to understand, and indeed could offer dependencies uh, that are druggable in their own right. So we need to uh, follow this up qu uh, quite a bit more, but the blend of sequencing and preclinical studies that we've already done are leading us to some very exciting and testable, eminently testable models. So finally, what we'd like to do is leverage this knowledge that we've gleaned from studies of resistance preclinically and clinically to speed the design of rational therapeutic combinations. And if you go from uh, this uh, panel, which is rather busy, to a more schematic view, which is shown here, we can already envision some tantalizing combinations that would be worth testing. So the combination of RAF and MEK inhibitors is already in clinical trials, and it looks like it's going to extend the uh, survival, but not by enough to say that we're done. But given what we know about a number of mechanism resistance, not all, but many, it seems reasonable that testing a combination that would include a RAF and an ERK inhibitor uh, with or without a MEK inhibitor might also be of interest, and as I mentioned, ERK inhibitors are in early clinical trials right now. But our preclinical data tells us that we can already anticipate new bypass pathways that will either reactivate uh, downstream transcriptional effectors or have additional uh, mechanisms. So in terms of the oncogenic transcriptional output, uh, the, as I mentioned, there are many transcription factors that can uh, elaborate this output. Perhaps we need to think about something that can suppress this, and it wouldn't be targeting transcription factors directly, but perhaps something that modifies chromatin, for example, an HDAC inhibitor or a histone methyltransferase inhibitor. Those are certainly in clinical trials. Perhaps one should consider maybe a RAF and an ERK and an HDAC inhibitor as a triple combination in BRF melanoma. Uh, conversely, we may have nominated some additional pathways involving G-protein coupled receptors or uh, GTPase, RAS-like GTPase signaling that could also be considered uh, as independent nodes. So already, from these studies, we feel like we're gravitating towards uh, the kinds of combinations that if we could test them clinically, would be high on our priority list based on what we've learned genetically and experimentally. Uh, let me skip this slide in the, in the interest of time. So in the last, really, uh, you know, th three to four minutes, because uh, I want to leave some time for questions, I just want to come back uh, to the ultimate test. Um, we, we've talked about knowledge of salient drivers, and we've talked about leveraging understanding of resistance to come up with novel combinations. But what about the here and now with the ingredients that we have in place? 
Well, this really gets down to clinical testing of the precision medicine hypothesis. And recently at the Dana-Farber and the Broad, we've, in, we've initiated a project which, which we call CAN-Seq, you know, cancer sequencing. Uh, it started with a U01 grant uh, that actually came from the NHGRI, although it was um, the money was uh, to, to fund this cancer effort was uh, supported by NCI, so we're very grateful for that. Uh, the focus of that grant is lung cancer and colorectal cancer, where the notion is that we are going to do prospective whole exome uh, sequencing, in some cases we're going to add transcriptome, on patients at the Dana-Farber and the Brigham, and we're going to return actionable information uh, to the clinical care team. So we're starting with uh, lung and colon. However, we were also recently funded as part of the stand-up to cancer effort in prostate cancer. So this is now being added to this overall mechanism. In addition, we are launching some studies together with Eric Weiner uh, in breast cancer and studies together with George Dimitri in sarcoma. So we have a five-pronged approach to CanSeq thus far, the notion of which is that uh, patient specimens are retrieved at the Dana-Farber and the Brigham, uh, DNA is extracted, uh, and in some cases RNA as well, sent to the Broad Institute for sequencing, and we are going to develop and apply several approaches to uh, read out data, which will get evaluated by a, a cancer genome evaluation committee, and the report will be made available to the treating oncologist. So uh, briefly, we have a series of heuristic algorithms uh, that have been uh, developed, and we're certainly going to be iterating, but to, uh, in, by collaboration with two medical oncology fellows, uh, Ellie Van Allen and uh, Nick Wagley in the lab. Uh, and so uh, there are a variety of approaches where we can both uh, bin uh, the, the samples based on actionability, investigate their relevance, uh, and also begin to look at variants of uncertain significance uh, and uh, map those. And we have developed a report that is online, and actually we plan to make this available broadly uh, quite soon because it's more or less ready uh, to go. Uh, but we have ways in which the, the committee that evaluates this can rapidly click and sort of see the, the content of what's come out of exomes. So there have been a variety of interesting uh, exomes that have emerged thus far, some of which have multiple uh, druggable alterations, others that have variants of uncertain significance, but they occur in druggable oncogenes. Uh, there are still others where um, we see uh, plausibly actionable alterations that are sort of off the beaten path, such as BCL6. Uh, mutations which we didn't necessarily know about before. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, this just sort of is a sobering reminder that even uh, as we throw the kitchen sink at samples genomically, we find uh, still cases where there's very little to do from an actionable standpoint. Either we see only P53 mutations and nothing else, or actually this striking case of a, of a sarcoma that had become resistant to radiation, we saw no uh, alterations that were plausibly actionable. So this is not going to be the be-all, end-all, but certainly it's a great way uh, to get us started. Uh, let, me, uh, let me, in the interest of time, close by uh, coming back to this. Uh, admittedly, it's an archetype, but pieces of this archetype are clearly implementable now and being implemented in many cancer centers around the country and around the world where we are, have begun with the patient. We are hoping to blend uh, serial biopsies with uh, omic profiling, novel approaches to data interpretation, uh, and ultimately uh, measuring response and resistance uh, in this approach. The knowledge that emerges can be blended with preclinical studies, companion preclinical experimental studies, uh, not only to refine our understanding on the biological end, but also to refine our thinking about high-priority novel therapeutic combinations that really might have a great chance at achieving durable control of many uh, different cancer types. And I'd like to close just by thanking a number of people who have been involved. I'll specifically highlight uh, Iran Hodas, who led the melanoma landscape uh, study uh, together with Ian Watson and Linda Chin's lab. This was a close collaboration with Linda Chin's lab. Corey Johannesson, who has led the systematic ORF screening. Uh, Nick Wagley, Ellie Van Allen, uh, who have led the CanSeq effort, and Stephen Whitaker has done the uh, RNAi screening work. And with that, I'll take questions if there's time. Questions? Maybe I will start. Um, you began your talk by saying that there are a lot of mutations in melanoma that probably are not responsible for the melanoma. Um, and then you ended by saying that there are a whole variety of different 
bypass alterations that enabled you to go past some of the initial uh, growth promoting pathways. Uh, and you got a lot of data based on uh, transfection experiments and knockout experiments and so on. So obviously it would be great to know in that patient who had hundreds of melanomas and all of which became resistant what all the different mechanisms were. But, but lacking that information, is there any indication that the genes that give you alternative pathways to bypass resistance are in any way related to the genes that come up in the initial melanoma? Have, is there any correspondence at all? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> so the question is whether or not, uh, is there, are the mutations that are going to be associated resistant, with resistance completely different than the sort of steady state landscape or is there overlap? The answer thus far is that there is a lot of overlap. In RAS uh, mutations are seen at baseline in 15 to 20 percent at least of melanomas. In RAS, the same in RAS mutations can arise as a mechanism of, of acquired resistance. MEC1 mutations, actually I glossed over this, but MEC1 mutations are seen at probably about 5 to 10 percent frequency at the steady state, but they are clearly associated with acquired resistance to melanoma. So thus far, uh, what we've seen genetically overlaps very strongly with the steady state landscape, which speaks to what you're saying. There's undoubtedly uh, a lot of heterogeneity that we're not measuring, uh, but that heterogeneity, so the, the heterogeneity that we see across many individuals may also exist to a certain extent within an individual and can be active at various points during the biology of the disease. What about all those genes that you threw out? Are any of them uh, reappearing later? Yeah, so I think an important point to emphasize here is that, you know, we're sort of not really throwing them out. We're just sort of saying if you want to discover the drivers, you have to have a scenario where you're not being confounded by passengers. But it's not to say that all of the genes that were thrown out are passengers. Indeed, we know uh, that there are drivers in that bin. Uh, it's just that at 121 samples, this is a statistical test, so you are limited by power. And actually, the higher the mutation rate in a cancer type, the more samples you need to sequence to be equivalently powered. So a lot of this is a power issue. And as you say, something that maybe is a passenger at one point in cancer could be acted on by evolution later in the cancer. Yes, um, something very exciting I heard from your, your talk. So you mentioned that the CGC42 and the RAC1 also muted in the melanoma. Yes. So can you tell us which residues are muted in these two molecules? Yes. So actually, it's, it's the analogous residue. So, <clears throat> so in RAC1, it's, uh, it's codon 29. In CDC42 and in Rho, it's, it's the analogous codon. So it's, it's exactly functionally the same mutation. So um, are these mutations could, could activate those CDC42 and the RAC1 molecules? So like, like CDC, uh, for example, for RAS mutations, right, like in the mutant at 12, G12, and the sixth one, around sixth one residues, that make RAS to be constitutively activated. Yes, so. But are those, those residues mutated in CGC42 and RAC1 that right. could activate those GTBS or not? Okay, so we have not seen the equivalent to codon 12 and codon 61 mutated in melanoma, right. but certainly people have made those mutations in RAC1 and shown that they are activating. One point that I should make is that, uh, and I actually haven't looked at those specific residues, but the RAC1 mutation is a C to T transition, so it is a UV driven mutation. And so it may, so you can imagine that mutations that are C to T transitions that are activating are more likely to be seen. I don't know, actually I know that codon 12 is not a C to T transition, it's actually a G to T transversion. So it may be that, you know, some of these mutations which are activating in other contexts, they're just statistically less likely to occur in melanoma. And given that RAC1 mutations, they're already low frequency events. We're just, they're just, even though they may theoretically occur, if you look at 10,000 melanomas, it's just below the frequency of detection that we have with 120. It's just one more quick question for you. Um, so, so when you take this melanoma cells with the mutations in RAC and CDC42, can you test it whether or not the activity for those two small GTBs is activated? You've got a higher level of GTP bond yes. CGC for the Yeah, it's a great now. question. So we have a couple of short-term cultures that have RAC1 mutation. We actually don't have uh, CDC42 as a cell line. Uh, and the short answer is you can detect, you can detect uh, RAC activation, but to say that it's high compared to other cells is actually thus far, we, maybe you were just, our assays are not sensitive enough. We can't really say in the steady state that we see that it's greater than 
uh, what you might see without the mutation, but it may be that our assays are not optimized for that yet. Okay. Endogenous, it can be a little tricky. Um, Levi, great talk. So you said that there's great heter heterogeneity in the number of mutations per tumor. Um, which would go from tens to thousands. The question is whether you remove from your analysis the ones that are extremely highly mutated, and if so, where do you draw the line? Yeah, uh, so I think now with the latest algorithm, we haven't removed them because, uh, you know, if you're sort of comparing within a sample exon to intron mutation rate, it, it doesn't really, it's a ratio, so it doesn't really hurt you. Um, but there have been other there have been other genome projects where one sees a certain distribution of mutation rate and then some outliers where removing the outliers has been helpful because otherwise you just start to see mutations all over the place. And particularly when you're talking about low frequency events, you're worried that that's all being skewed by, you know, one or two samples. Yeah. Uh, hi, Levi. Beautiful talk. So I wanted to get back to Michael's question really as it relates to inherent versus acquired resistance. So you have all these UVB mutations, and we see them in our mouse models as well. Um, I don't know whether UV causes all this with one shot or multiple times or, you know, whatever. Uh, the mutations that you see in the recurrent disease, do they tend to be UVB mutations? Do they, are they things that you think are lurking around in some cells and then they become more important in resistance? Um. So I, I think hopefully in the not too distant future we'll have enough relapsing specimens where we can sort of give, where I can give you a systematic answer. But the short answer is yes. The short answer is we have not globally seen a different distribution of mutations. Now I think what really the key thing is going to be when we actually hone in on the mutations that are different in the post-relapse compared to the pretreatment at an exome level. You know, does the delta is it still have a high C to T transition? That's that I can't really answer yet. We haven't done that analysis, but very soon we should be able to answer that. I think it's a very important question. Yeah, I, I want to look at your problem in a very simple way. The lessons we have learned that if we are targeting an upstream component of a pathway uh, which is relevant to cancer, we should expect uh, downstream acquired mutation on some other component. Uh, hopefully, with your kind of work, we you know, should be able to predict what will be the cascade of those mutations. So, is it appropriate to say that we have de when we have decided to target an upstream component or upstream gene, that we should get ready for targeting the downstream gene, because invariably we will get that mutation as a resistance? Yeah, I think I think it's an interesting. An interesting general theme that one could lob up would be to say, if we have either predicted a priori or at least, or better yet, experimentally, that yes, this downstream pathway is always a mechanism resistant, why not go in with an upfront combination that hits both the index oncoprotein and the downstream pathway? Uh, that's essentially what the raf met combination attempts to do partially, but maybe in lung cancer and other cancers, one should try that as well. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting, and people yeah, are certainly the, thinking the about that. The issue is a priori. You know, RAF and MAC, you know, we knew a as a matter of fact, but I'm saying we, if we could predict beforehand and be ready from the start. Yeah, I mean, I think that, so I think the short answer is it's, it's worth trying. Thanks. I think we're out of time for questions if I, if I read you correctly. <laughs> well, um, let's thank Dr. Garraway for an exciting talk and for helping us start our series this year so well. We have a reception, I believe, that's supported for the Foundation for the Advanced Education in the Sciences in the usual place in the library and a chance to chat more informally. Thanks a lot.